Hello and welcome to this video, part three of three in creating your own sort algorithm visualizer. My name is Mike Duffy. There are only two things remaining uh, to do in this video series. One is to take care of a couple of timing exceptions. We'll do that. And the other item is to add another sort algorithm to the dropdown to demonstrate how you add them to the program. You can find the completed code on my GitHub account, which is referenced in the video description below on all three parts of the video. And I hope you enjoy this final part in the Sort Algorithm Visualizer project. Let's get started. Okay, in the bubble sort engine, let's do that uh, little bit of refactoring I was talking about. I think it can get a little bit confusing if you're going to be peppering draw rectangle methods in a few different places. Uh, so you might want to consolidate that into a method that makes a little more sense. So what we're going to do is have a method called draw bar, and we can consolidate that functionality into one place. And so this draws the black background, and it draws however high a white um, a white bar that's necessary. And then up here in the swap routine, we can replace that by a couple of calls to draw bar. So let's make sure that we didn't break anything. Okay, so it works. And you can see that the pause and the resume work. And you might be lulled into a false sense of security that everything about your program is fine, and that's not the case. There are some exceptions that can happen, and uh, it can be demonstrated by continually banging on the pause and resume button, as I'm doing here. Now take a look over on the right in the diagnostic tools over in this area. You can see that as I'm pausing and resuming, uh, we're consuming more and more memory until it gets up to, uh, I was expecting something like 65 megabytes, and that may be, in fact, what we see. Yeah, right about 65 megabytes, the garbage collector comes along. That's what this little yellow mark here is. And then the uh, as I'm not pressing the button, the memory usage stabilizes. Now, uh, what's going on here? Well, we're going to cover that in just a minute uh, while we're talking about other things that can go wrong. Uh, let me give it a few more chances to blow up in our faces. And if nothing happens in a few more clicks, uh, we will move on without demonstrating. We'll go up to one more garbage collection, uh, right around 65 megabytes. And there it goes. Okay, well, it didn't blow up but let me tell you about it. Okay, in the button handler for the pause button, you can see what we're doing here. If we're not paused, we're going to pause and we're going to tell the background worker to cancel its operation. Now there's a little bit of a time lag there. It just sends a signal to the background worker. It doesn't force anything to happen immediately, so the background worker can continue to run for a few seconds. Well, I shouldn't say a few seconds. It'll be much less than a second. However, it doesn't happen immediately. And the problem comes in if we're going to be doing the opposite. If we were paused when we click the button, then we're going to execute this section of code, which is going to resume it. We're going to mark our application as running. We're going to refresh the display with the current state of the array. And then we're going to run the background worker again with whatever is selected in the combo box. If you send a cancellation to the background worker just as it's finishing up, there can be some timing things that happen there. But the one we're talking about here, uh, the problem that may happen in this program, is that uh, we may come in here and try to fool with the graphics object while the background worker has not finished with it yet. So one thing we can do is to ignore the button click if the worker is still busy. We can just ignore the button click altogether, and that's kind of a simple way to solve this problem. Uh, I believe it solves all the various things that might happen. Uh, I've tested it some, but I'm not absolutely sure that nothing else can go wrong. But for me, it's worked so far. 
And now let's take care of one other little bug that may happen. If you click the Start button before you click the Reset button, there's an exception that's caused. So let's take care of that now by automatically invoking what would have happened had you clicked Reset. So if you hit Start without clicking Reset, in effect, the Reset Handler is called first, and we know that it's needed because the array of integers will be null when we click that. So once we have the reset code run, the array will no longer be null, and then we'll be able to go on and process the rest. So now that little problem should be taken care of. Let's make sure that we didn't break anything. What we'll do is click Start without clicking Reset, and it works. Pause works, resume works, and now let's try that again to show you what will happen if the condition is not handled. So we'll try that. We'll come down here to the background worker do work and show that an exception is caused when that happens. We'll click start and there is an exception, which you can see is value cannot be null. So. Uh, so this is an empty catch block, which is generally not a thing recommended to do. Exception processing is very slow. Uh, generally, you don't want to have an empty catch block because uh, what's happening is you're just swallowing the exception. Uh, we're not doing anything about it. We're not notifying anybody, and it's really slow. So that's generally not a good thing to do. Uh, but the effect is um, it appears that the start button does nothing. Uh, so let's go ahead and uncomment that, run it again, and when you click Start, it does an automatic reset and starts up. So everything seems fine. Now it will be time to add another sort engine, um, another algorithm to the program so that you can see the uh, selection in the drop-down list. And you'll be able to experiment with your own sort algorithms, um, adding them, taking them out, modifying them, and making copies, and changing them slightly, whatever you'd like to do. So we have to decide on the next sort algorithm that we're going to add. Well, I'm going to add a sort algorithm whose performance is so bad that it'll be difficult to believe. Um, actually, when I was a little kid, uh, I would be fooling around with a deck of playing cards and uh, stumbled upon, well, uh, you know, I would want to put them in order. So um, I actually stumbled upon a couple of uh, sort algorithms, and I don't know if they've ever been implemented by anybody, but trying one out in code, uh, I found out just exactly how badly performing it is. And I'll use that as an example uh, so that I don't waste a chance for you to come up with a clever algorithm yourself. What we're going to do is we're going to add a class to the project. You can right-click on the project, Add. Uh, now you can either say Add New Item and select a class, or you can say Add and Class is down at the bottom. So you can see uh, Visual C Sharp Items is selected, and Class is selected automatically. And we're going to call this one Sort Engine Move to Back. Which is a very bad, low-performing, terrible sort algorithm that I came up with. I'm sure I'm not the first one to come up with it, uh, but you're going to be surprised how bad it is. It's, uh, it's really slow, but it does demonstrate what we're trying to achieve here. So we click Add. You can see that it's added here. And it's brought up in the editor automatically. Now, the first thing we want to do is implement the iSort Engine interface. And you can see the red squigglies. And down here in the error list, you can see that the required methods are not implemented. So I'm going to start out by actually copying what's in the bubble sort algorithm. Now I can hear somewhat over half of the people who may be watching this uh, automatically say if you copy and paste code that it's a problem. 
Yeah, that's true, uh, but we're using it uh, for a starting point, and I think that if you're implementing an interface where the method signatures are going to have to be the same anyway, it's somewhat more forgivable. So I'm going to do it. Okay, paste that in here. Now this should be pretty much legal. Let's see. We'll do a control dot on some of these things. Put in the, um, okay, we only need one class. We only needed one namespace. So uh, now we're going to change the name here. And we're only going to change those things that are necessary. We are not going to have such a thing as swap in this one. Uh, we'll have a different thing. Draw bar can stay, is sorted, can stay, and redraw can stay. Okay. So what do we need to do to the next step method? What we're going to do here is we are going to compare the value in the array that we're currently looking at to the next one that follows it. And then down here at the end, uh, we're going to increment the next thing in the list and then uh, return. So uh, that's how we can do one minimal step towards sorting the array and then returning. So we need to declare this current list pointer. So we'll do that right here. That should take care of just about everything. And then we will need to implement this rotate function. So what that means is uh, we're going to move uh, when we find an out of order element, we're going to take the higher one and we're going to move it all the way to the back of the list. So that means everything between the point we found it to the end of the list needs to be shifted toward the front of the list by one slot. And that's what we're going to call rotate. So control dot generate the method. There it is. So we get rid of the not implemented exception, and first thing we're going to do is save the value of the current list pointer that we came in with. We're going to save the entry number into a temporary variable. Uh, we're going to mark the ending point of the array. This should probably be made an invariant expression somewhere. Uh, I don't know whether or not the C Sharp compiler will optimize this away uh, because, uh, you know, it's the same on every call to rotate. I'm not sure whether or not the compiler optimizations will get rid of that. And then a magic part will happen in this spot. And then afterwards, we're going to move the value that we saved uh, before to the end of the array. And we're going to put its new bar on the screen. Now for this middle part where the rotation actually happens, that's going to look uh, like this. We're going to go from the current list pointer that was passed into it, i.e. the location of the elephant that needs to be moved, and we're going to step all the way to the end of the array, looking at every item, and then in there, we are going to shift that entry one spot towards the front, and we're going to then update uh, what it looks like uh, in the graphics object. So that should be it. And if I've done everything right, this sort algorithm should work as of now. So let's give it a try. Now let's see if we've done everything right. Uh, the new sort algorithm should have uh, been picked up automatically. And in fact, it is in the drop-down list, so we can choose it. We can get a fresh list of integers to work on, and we can start it up. So let's see what happens. And it's working, so you can see that it's implementing the rotation that I said when it finds an item, uh, an item out of order. And it moves it all the way to the back, and as you can see, it's rotating uh, the en entries behind it up every time it does that. So it should get a little faster towards the end of the list when it has to draw fewer bars. Drawing is the slow part. And it is speeding up and then back to the front. So I guarantee you this will eventually sort the list, but the performance is so bad that um, 
I haven't actually measured it, but just a rough estimate, I bet it might take something like a day to complete sorting this list. Uh, it's pretty terrible, so not a legitimate attempt at a sort algorithm. Uh, it's just a demonstration of getting more than one item into the dropdown and being able to switch back and forth. Now check this out. The pause button works and the way we've implemented this, you can switch sort engines in the middle of the operation and resume it and it will switch to the other sort algorithm. That's kind of a side effect of the way that I've implemented the background worker, uh, which we can talk about now. So if we go over to the main form called form one, in the background worker do work method, you can see that each time we start up, let's uh, look at the resume button, we're going to perform the background worker run worker async with the argument of whatever is selected in the drop-down box, and that's the sort algorithm you've chosen. So anytime you resume, it will check again what the algorithm is now, and uh, take a look down here in the do work method. Every time we call it, we are creating a new sort engine, and that's why earlier, when I was alternately pausing and resuming, the memory kept going up and uh, consumed uh, until it got to about 65 megabytes and then the garbage collector would come along. It's because we were creating a brand new sort engine every time the resume button was clicked. So you can investigate the manual reset event if you'd like to truly pause and resume work, but I haven't chosen to uh, pursue that here. Okay, and that is the method by which we can switch sort algorithms in the middle of the operation. Now, if you're going to implement any fancier algorithms, such as quicksort, merge sort, any of the more sophisticated ones, those algorithms are going to be much less tolerant of being switched in the middle of their operations. In many cases, one of those will scramble the other hopelessly, and if you keep switching back and forth, you may not ever get anywhere. If you do keep switching, but with things like the move to the back sort and bubble sort, those things will continue working towards an actual solution. Well, that's it for this video and the three-part series that it's a part of. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found something useful in it. My GitHub account is shown below in the video description where you can get the complete source. I'll see you next time. Thanks.